Oh, well, now I feel a little bit bad, but th thank you very much. Um, so yes, uh, welcome everyone. It's the first uh, talk of the first day of the main Linux conference. Thank you for being here and joining me here. Uh, the, this talk is, gonna, is titled Plastic is Forever, Making Tomu's Injection Molded Case. Uh, now, if you went to LCA last year, you would have gotten one of these. This is Tomu. It is a microcomputer that fits in your USB port. So it's a USB-sized uh, computer. And this was the, the brainchild of Tim, who's sitting up, up here in the fourth row. Um, and I was brought on because I wanted to do a crowdfunding campaign. And when I got this, it didn't really have a case. It had a 3D printed uh, slug that you put in the USB port, um, but it's, it's great for hackers, but it's not the kind of thing you can make a, you can actually sell a product around. And so one of the stretch goals of the campaign was to make a plastic case for it. Uh, and I'm gonna spoil it for you. The fact that we actually met the crowdfunding campaign and produced this case uh, is proof that we can actually do it. And so the goal of this talk is to tell you that plastic is within the realm of possibility for your open source project. Um, for this particular case, it's clear, uh, which normally costs a bit extra, but I got lucky in that Tomu's are very, very tiny. Uh, and so they ended up giving us the clear color for no extra charge. Uh, and this particular case, just for um, uh, trivia, is made out of uh, something called polycarbonate. Uh, there's all sorts of acronyms you hear when you're talking about plastic PC for polycarbonate, PVC, ABS. Uh, there are people who know much more about that than me. That's the sort of thing where you ask the factory what they, what they suggest and they will recommend based on your requirements something, uh, you know, a particular kind of plastic. And so this is what it looks like when you put them together. Uh, when you put the Tomu in, it gives this very nice click. Uh, and so for the next 45 minutes, I'm going to tell you guys about uh, the process that I took to build this. Uh, we're going to go to some factories. Uh, I'm going to learn how a plastic case like this is built. Uh, and then I'm going to go over some of the tools that I use to design the case uh, as well. And I'm going to try and convince you uh, that plastic is completely applicable. You can actually use plastic for your open source hardware projects if you're getting in the volume of uh, at least a few hundred. So it is not within, uh, it's not out of the realm of possibility. And if you design it right, you can actually reuse the products, you reuse the case for multiple products. This is uh, FOMU, which we're crowdfunding now. Uh, it's roughly the same size. It has a different uh, PCB profile. So we're gonna have to make some changes uh, and I'll go over uh, why it's not going to be as difficult the second time around. So you can reuse the case once you have it for, uh, once you have the initial design. Um, now a little bit about me. Uh, I live in Singapore, which is here. Uh, and you may notice that it's a little bit far away if you zoom out. Um, Singapore is nice in that it's close to China. Uh, and this is important for me because I really enjoy making hardware products. Here's a few of the things that I've done. Uh, the Novena open source laptop, the Chumbi bedside alarm clock. These are all open products, uh, and some of them even have cases, like Danny TV. Uh, I work in Singapore uh, with a, a guy named Bunny. Uh, before, he's done a lot of this, but with Tomu, this is the first project where I did the plastic case myself. And so the outline of this talk, it's going to be in three stages. Uh, first, we're going to visit a factory and, and actually go over the process of manufacturing the case. Uh, then I'll go over the process of designing the case, so the software used. Uh, and if you're into 3D printing, uh, you may uh, be familiar with some of the, the techniques that we use there. And finally, now that you know how plastic is designed and how injection molding works, I'm going to go over some just common household items that I found while I was producing the talk uh, and point out some of the artifacts that are left over from the manufacturing process. Um, so let's get started, manufacturing tour. Uh, I love this XKCD comic for two reasons. Uh, the person is asking, uh, when somebody takes a photo, I want it so that we can tell if they're a national park, and the person responds, oh, easy, just GIS lookup uh, for a you know, database of parks. And it goes, check whether it's a picture of a bird. And it goes, I need a research team in five years. And there's two reasons why I love this. The first reason is, since this comic came out, I think those two difficulties have swapped. <laughs> Because with, with GPS, people are very privacy focused, and with the research team, you just load ImageNet and throw the image in, and there, get bird or not bird. Um, but two, because it illustrates how, to an outsider, they don't really know how difficult a project is. 
And in order to know how difficult something is, you really need to understand it. And so in order to do that, it's very important to take a visit to the factory. And so with that, let's take a visit to our plastics factory. Uh, when you go to China, every factory looks like this. Um, I'm not sure why. They all have this kind of tile pattern on the building. They all have no English anywhere. They have that red sign of the, the front door uh, and motorbikes everywhere. Um, they all look like this, regardless of whether it's an injection molding factory, uh, a PCB house, um, or uh, I, I've you know, been to some, some wire factories. Uh, we went to a sanitary pad factory that looked exactly like this. Um, so they all look like this. Um, the factory that we work with is kind of a, a cut rate. Uh, uh, they're very low cost. Uh, they happen to be on the fourth floor, which in Chinese four sounds like the word for death. So they get that at a discount. Um, when you go in, you see things like this. Uh, you don't really think about where plastic comes from, but for the factory, they get it in bags like this. So this is a bag of polycarbonate. Um, for the factory, when they get it in, they need to make sure that the plastic is not fake. They need to make sure the plastic hasn't been mistreated, and so it goes into an incoming quality control area. Um, and the amount, the different kinds of plastic can be in various colors. Uh, when you open it up, you see the pellets. This is what raw plastic looks like. Uh, and a thing to note here is that you can, you can clearly see that there are two different colors in here. Uh, the default color is kind of um, clearish white. And then to that, they add various other colors of pellets. Um, I'm a little bit surprised there's so, much, so many black pellets in here. Normally, the mixture is much um, fewer color. Um, but depending on the final color you're looking for in your product, they're going to come up with different mixtures. Uh, when they change color, uh, they need to flush a whole bunch through the machine. So if you wanted, for example, a red case and a blue case, uh, when they make that change, they're going to have to waste a whole bunch of material just flushing it out of the machine, because that, that's, that's how it works. Um, speaking of the machine, this is what they look like. This is kind of the business end of it. Uh, you can see there's one of those bags up on top. They're just protecting it from keeping birds to fly, flying in there and, and dust and things like that. It's a very high quality shop. Um, and you can see the step ladder that the guy goes up to, to refill the machine. Um, now, this isn't particular to this, this factory. Here's a, another factory. Um, you know, it looks completely different, right? This, there's just more machines here. Um, they all have this, this blue, well, this one has this blue cowling that protects the, the, the workers from the moving bits. Uh, and just for flavor, here's a completely different factory. Um, you know, these are all taken at lunchtime when, when they're empty because uh, uh, it's, uh, yeah, this, this is a different factory. Now, what does it look like when they actually pull a shot, when they actually do an injection molding uh, run? Um, it looks like this. You can see uh, the machine closes uh, on the mold there, and it just kind of sits there for you know, 30 to 60 seconds. And it's, it's, if I'm completely honest, very boring. <laughs> because this is, this is the default state. Um, so that's what we're going for. What does it look like in the machine? What, you know, what is actually causing the shot? Well, that's what's called a mold. And so these are some very carefully, uh, what's the word, stored molds. Uh, this is just kind of a corner of the shop. And each one of these is a different product. Each one of these is uh, from a different uh, uh, customer. Uh, this factory just kind of piles them up all in the corner. I kind of shudder to think what happens when the one on the bottom, like, I would like my mold, please, and they have to go move them all by hand. Um, but, you know, they're hap they'll happily do that. Um, and when you see this, there's a lot of metal there. And the single biggest cost of injection molding is the cost of the steel, because steel's expensive. Um, so one third of the cost of the tool is just going to be the raw cost of steel. So if everybody in the, the, the assembly line worked for free, you would still only drop the price by you know, two thirds because metal is expensive. Um, and these things are heavy. Uh, if we take the Tomu mold down, you can see here is a Tomu sitting on its, its very own mold. Uh, there's a couple of things you can see when you look at this picture. Uh, the first off, you know, there's one tomu there, and there's four what are called cavities. Um, that's because this is what's called a family mold. So remember I said that a shot takes a 30 to 60 seconds. For tomu, it's about 45 seconds. Um, 
we can speed that up by a factor of 4x by having four different cavities. So one shot takes 45 seconds, but we get four cases out of there. So that's you know, 4x speed up, multi-threading, hey, good. Um, uh, some other things to note, there's that white bit in the middle, kind of a, a stick shape. That's what's called the runner. Uh, and that is a piece of, in our case, wastage, where the plastic flows through that channel, because remember, it's molten plastic, uh, in order to get to the cavities. Uh, the other thing to note is this is one half of the mold, because with injection molding, there's two halves. And so here is a picture of both halves of the mold. Now, when this injection molding process happens, these two come together like this, they fill with plastic, and then they separate. And this is where we get the golden rule of injection molding in that you can have no overhangs. You can't have a place, piece of plastic over another piece of plastic because then they couldn't separate. And this is the biggest thing that makes injection molding different from 3D printing. With 3D printing, you can have overhangs, and it doesn't matter at all. Uh, aside from support structures, but with injection molding plastic, unless you do uh, various clever things, you can't have any overhangs. Because uh, if you had an overhang, these things couldn't separate. Um, I'd like to take a, a you know, closer look at the, the bottom half of the mold. Uh, and if you take a look at this, you can see here the imprint of the PCB. So with Tomu, there's a large central microprocessor, and that's the big square that you see on this family mold. Uh, and one other thing to note is that there are two pieces here. There is the big, chunky outer bit, and then there's the smaller inner bit. The, inner, the outer bit is what's called a base, uh, and that is more or less uh, uniform across all of your tools. The center is called the core, and that is customized for your particular tool. So when we buy, or when, when you buy a tool, you buy both the base and the core. So this effectively is ours. We could, if we wanted to, go up with a truck and say, hey, I would like to, to take my mold away, and the factory would go, wait, what? Uh, okay, here you go. Um, but we keep it there because it's heavy, and they're really the only people who could do it. But we can reuse the base for other parts. And in fact, for FOMU, what we're going to do is we're going to just swap out the core. Because the core is a little tiny piece of metal, and it's relatively cheap to replace that and reuse the whole base. So here's one source of savings. Once you have your base product, you can swap out the core uh, for relatively little cost. In fact, I didn't even mention uh, the plastic in the FOMO campaign, because it's going to be so uh, easy to get this, this swapped out. It's such a, a low cost versus the initial cost of buying the whole tool. Um, the question is, once you pull the shot, once you have done the injection molded process, how do you get it to peel off? I mean, when you make cookies, right? You have the pan, you grease it up, and then you take your, your spatula and you flip them off. Well, you can't really do that with this. So they use what are called ejector pins. Uh, and I'm going to show some pictures of that in the next slide. But here you can see there's this big blue spring and this plate. And this plate actually moves up uh, when it comes to ejecting uh, the piece. One other nice thing to note here is that um, the factory has understood what this product is, kind of. Uh, and they actually put USB uh, device written in Chinese on the side. Because we gave it to them. We said, this is how it's used. Uh, please help us make sure that this works well. And so they've started to understand that, hey, this is supposed to go in a USB port. Therefore, we will make sure to tune everything such that it will fit in the USB port. Uh, now, I mentioned these ejector pins. Afterwards, what happens is this, this plate moves up and some pins pop out. Uh, this is from the Novena project. Uh, I didn't have any pictures of this, so thank you, Bunny. Uh, so you can see a bunch of pins here that go through the mold. So once the ejection process is done, these pins will pop out the piece, leaving the mold clean for the next um, shot. Uh, now, I mentioned runners earlier. Uh, this is what it looks like when the finished Tomu cases come out. And so you, there are a few things to note here. One, you can see that this is a family mold. You can see the four Tomu cases still attached to the runner. Uh, and you can see all the wastage that, that one um, shot has. Uh, and there are a couple of ways you can avoid this. Um, for really, really high volume uh, pieces, they use what's called a, a hot runner, where the runner never actually solidifies. Um, that's kind of expensive to, to set up. 
Um, what they do for this is they just throw it back in the hopper and it gets ground up and they reuse uh, the plastic. Um, but this, this gives you an idea of, of the wastage. The other thing is that when you break these cases off, there's always a little bit of uh, flashing. There's a little bit of, of plastic left over. Uh, and you can sometimes have them grind that off. Um, ideally, you design the case such that uh, people can't tell it's there. Uh, but if you have them grind it off, of course, they have to pay somebody to, with, uh, with a polishing brush, and that uh, takes a little bit more time and adds cost. Uh, so hopefully, you just hope that people can't, you, you don't know it's there because uh, they don't know to look for it. I'm sorry, people here now will know to look for it. Uh, but so it's the kind of thing that um, Apple famously with the iPhone 3G, uh, it had these very nice rounded edges and, and they paid somebody to file off things like the parting line and uh, the, the uh, gate where it entered into the piece. Um, and you know, also there's like a, a small bubble on, on the runner, but that's fine because it's the runner and nobody really cares about the runner for your final product. Now, interestingly, I actually tried to get the factory to send me some units still on the runner and they, they, that request kind of got lost because who does that? I mean, why would you want plastic cases on a runner? Like that is not a thing you normally do. Um, and so I had to go there and, and get this photo just because it's not the kind of thing that why would you want it on a runner? Unless you happen to be giving a talk about plastic cases and how it works, like you never really want to see the pieces on the runner. So it's kind of interesting that that request got dropped. <laughs> um, now I, I did design this and, and gave it to the factory. Uh, one thing to note, everybody in China uses what they call Pro-E, but apparently it's been renamed to Coreo Elements Pro. Uh, everyone uses this, but it's okay because kind of the JPEG uh, P PNG of the, the CAD world is called STEP. Uh, and if you give them a STEP file, they'll be able to open it up and, and do whatever, make edits to it and, and send them back. Um, so it's, it's very important that you use a tool that is a cable, capable of creating and editing STEP files. Uh, so I sent them the STEP file for the case and they kind of modified it and they sent it back. They said, hey, is it okay if we make these changes? Uh, and I'm going to go into those later. Um, and then they created that steel tool. But in order to create the tool, they first had to model it in Pro-E uh, and then send it to a factory to design it. Uh, and this is the model that they came up with. And uh, I just emailed the factory. I'm like, hey, can you send me the step file for the tool? And they said, OK, sure. Like, why would you want to see this? Um, I did post this in the Tomu hardware repository, by the way, I'll have a link at the end, uh, because everything that has ever been injection molded has one of these tools, but you don't usually see them because they're usually not very useful or interesting to people. Uh, but I think you guys will find it interesting because you're here. Um, so I'm going to, to peel it apart and show you some of the more interesting aspects of this tool. Um, if we do a cutaway, uh, this is it on its side. Uh, so things to note here, you can see the, the kind of pinkish gray of the, the plate that drives the ejector pins. Uh, in this, the ejector pins are, are orange and yellow. Uh, and other things to note, there's the green uh, inlet here, and the plastic in this particular one is gray. Uh, this is actually auto color coded by the program that was editing this. Um, so the plastic flows in from this green bit. That was, remember, the, the bag that was sitting on top. The plastic flows in through there, up, because this is on its side, up, and that's the, uh, the, the runner. Uh, and then it flows in. And when it's done, these ejector pins pop the whole thing out. Uh, to give another view of just the, 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 the thing in, in turquoise is the core. Uh, you could see there are these pins on this side that uh, are what are called lifters. And these lifters are what give it that nice snap. Um, uh, these. Uh, so remember I said like the number one rule of injection molding plastic is you're not allowed to have overhangs. Uh, well, the factory was very clever when they designed these, these lifters. They said, hey, um, we noticed that the PCB will fall out because you have no way of, of keeping it in. Well, what if we added these lifters here? Um, and these cost a couple of hundred dollars to add on. And, and uh, I'm so happy they recommended that because it makes the Tomu case so much more um, satisfying, I guess, because when you push the, the PCB in, it actually makes this kind of clicking sound. And that's because of these lifters. And, and here's kind of a better view of the lifters. You can see in this, the cases are, are brown. Uh, and this uh, silver and 
yellow pegs that poke in here um, cause an interruption in the design of the case uh, that, that we don't actually have any overhangs. Uh, it's just an interruption of material. Uh, and this just, just I mean, this, this makes the whole case. This, this feature means that we don't have to go with the original idea I had of doing heat staking with, with this peg. Um, the, the case just kind of sits in the holder on its own. So the question is, how was the case designed? And if you are into 3D printing, maybe this is going to be kind of an old hat to you. Uh, but I'm going to go over the basics, uh, just kind of high-level overview of how parametric modeling works. Um, if you have a 3D printer, uh, that's great. It makes it easy, easier uh, because you can, uh, of course, prototype easily. Uh, 3D printing, though, is not like injection molding. There are a few key differences. There's the one that I keep talking about, about no overhangs. Uh, there's also problems where uh, when you 3D print, you have support structures that you don't have with injection molded plastic. Um, so for example, this case has very thin edges and the support structures on the 3D printer I was using uh, kept causing those edges to be bumpier than they should be. Uh, there's also just the, the design tolerances uh, for injection molded plastic 0 0.4, 0 0.5 millimeters is a good uh, minimum width uh, and not many 3D printers uh, are able to, to hit that, that small uh, size. A lot of them, I think, point, uh, I think one millimeter uh, is, is the minimum, uh, but I have to, I'd have to see for sure. Um, when you do design, you're going to be using a lot of references. Uh, this is the USB spec. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a five and a half megabyte PDF. This is from chapter six, mechanical. Uh, so you're going to be staring a lot at things like this. Uh, so this is the receptacle that we're trying to fit into. Um, so we need to know, you know, is, if I make something, will it fit in there? We're also trying to clone this, which is plug. Um, and so uh, one, some interesting numbers to note here. Uh, the plug is supposed to be a stamped metal uh, uh, case that wraps around. And if you see there, the number, the width of the stamped metal is 0.3, uh, which is kind of annoying because remember I said uh, injection molding plastic 0.5 is kind of the minimum. Uh, you can cheat a little bit. We did 0.4 and it's still still works relatively well. So you're going to be having always one of these windows open with these numbers when you're designing it. Um, the other thing that I really recommend is, is hardware, something like this. Uh, these are two very important tools when you're designing. First off, the, the, the vernier calipers down here on the bottom, uh, because when you're dealing with something, you're like, how big is 0.1 millimeter? How big is one millimeter? You know, your screen is this big or, or this big you kind of lose sight of the actual scale of things you have. So I really recommend a pair of digital calipers when you do this sort of design. Uh, and the other thing up there is this DigiKey PCB ruler. Um, this, this thing is, is surprisingly useful for doing PCB design as well. They have things like silkscreen examples on here and, and drill sizes. And again, when you're zooming into a PCB, you think, ah, 0.1 millimeters, that's huge. That's like this big on the screen. No, it's much smaller than you think. And having a good physical reference is, is super huge in realizing that the thing you're designing on the screen eventually will exist in the real world. Um, in terms of software that you're going to need, I highly recommend FreeCAD. Uh, FreeCAD is an amazing piece of software. Uh, it's a lot like SolidWorks in terms of its uh, ability to uh, act as a parametric mod modeler, uh, but it's, it's open source. Uh, the big thing that FreeCAD can do, and I put this in giant letters, is it can actually create step files. Like, I'm going to say this, I hope somebody proves me wrong, but FreeCAD is the only open source software that can create step files. Uh, there are other open source packages that can read them in. Um, I'm, I'm hoping somebody proves me wrong, but uh, FreeCAD can create step files. If you use OpenSCAD, FreeCAD has an OpenSCAD workbench that you could import it into FreeCAD and then export to step files. So when you're working with the factory, FreeCAD will create the step files that you then send to the factory to actually get produced. One of the other cool things is that FreeCAD will read KiCAD files. So I just opened up the KiCAD PCB file for this. This is one of the FOMO EVT boards. Um, just open it up and it will give you a 3D representation of it. Uh, it will read things like the PCB thickness so that it's correct. Uh, most of the KiCAD uh, uh, built-in libraries have step models as well. Uh, so you can see it pulled in some buttons 
and some passes and the microcontroller that I'm using or the, the CPU package I'm using, um, FreeCAD can open up KiCAD PCB files that you can then use as a reference when you design the case. Uh, and so now I'm going to talk about designing the case for uh, Tomu. And it's basically going to boil down to three steps. Uh, step one, you're going to open up the PCB. And trust me when I say that the components are there, it's just with Tomu, uh, the top is considered the USB pads and the bottom is where all the components are. So they were loaded, they're just on the bottom side. Uh, so open up the PCB uh, and then you're going to create a step. Uh, uh, click this button and create a sketch. So now step two, step one is open the file, step two is to create the sketch. Um, now, sketching is a 2D thing. It's, it's exactly like drafting on a drafting board. Uh, you have elements here. So elements are things like uh, lines and points and rectangles and, and compound elements like uh, circles and ovals and, and, and things like that. Uh, and so this is exactly like using something like Inkscape, uh, except you actually need to define what are called constraints. And so these are the constraints. And so you define, here's a line, and then you need to constrain that line in terms of this is how long it is, this is where it is in relationship to these other lines, and then you need to define the whole thing in relation to some reference point. And if you look here, uh, for this first step, uh, I've defined constraints, things like the tall axis is 12.2 millimeters, it's 12 millimeters wide, the bottom is 12 millimeters wide, uh, and because it's a rectangle, the bottom and the top lines are supposed to be um, uh, equal, so they're, they're equal length. Uh, because it's a square, they're perpendicular to each other. So you get a lot of this for free, but then you can also see the lovely readable red text. Uh, it's uh, 6.1 millimeters from the center. So for this particular sketch, I've chosen the center as my point, uh, and I have defined all these constraints and the, uh, there's some small text on the left there that says fully constrained. It's green. Green means good. So that's all you need to know. Fully constrain everything. Click the close button and then we get back to this. We're back now at the part designer in the 3D sketch, or 3D space. So we have a 2D sketch. We're going to make a 3D uh, model of it. We do what's called a pad. So we click one of the pad buttons on top. Uh, and then that brings it out into uh, the third dimension. It basically takes that sketch and extrudes it upwards. In this case, we've defined it as two millimeters. Uh, it doesn't really matter what the values are, just know that right around there uh, is where you define the parameters. And that's really it. If we go to a isometric view, uh, you can see there's some Z fighting going on between because the top of the case is exactly equal with the top of the PCB. Uh, and so they're fighting with each other. So what we need to do is we need to create a pocket for the PCB to fit in. Um, and I mean, that's really it. So we create a sketch and we do something to it. These two things you repeat over and over again. And that's really all there is to making a 3D model. So we click on the top, we're gonna create a sketch in here, click the create sketch button, draw the sketch, constrain it, bring it back out to the third world. And then we do something to it uh, in this case, we're creating what's called a pocket. So we take that sketch, we carve it down a little bit, and uh, now we have a space for the PCB. Uh, in our case, we made a pocket of 0.8, just because the PCB is 0.6, and uh, the real world is not as exact as the computer world. If you make it 0.6, uh, the copper is going to have some thickness, there's going to be some variance, so just add a little bit, 0.8, uh, close enough. Uh, if we hide the PCB, you can see there we go, we have a nice case, uh, and all we've done is created sketches and done things to them, either padding or pocketing. Um, and like I said, it's really those, those two things over and over again. Uh, the problem we have now is our PCB will fit, but our PCB has things on it, so we need to create spaces for the passives. Um, click on the, the, the surface you want again. Uh, now I've flipped the PCB upside down so you can see the passives there, and really I'm just using them as kind of a guideline. Um, you can see there's huge margins here. The rectangle is way around uh, the, the models. Uh, and that's just because I don't necessarily trust the KiCad files. I'm treating them as a guideline. Um, the KiCad models, you know, maybe I'm using different uh, size resistors or 
uh, maybe the, the, the uh, models drift a little bit when the pick and place machine goes down or when it uh, run, gets run through the oven, some things can drift a little bit. So it's important to give some amount of padding. Uh, but again, just uh, draw the box, constrain it against some point. In this case, I'm constraining it against the middle. Um, bring it out into the, the 3D view and make a pocket. Um, do the same thing for the CPU, draw a box on that plane, make a pocket. The same thing for the LEDs on the sides, draw a box, make a pocket. Um, then you can get a little bit fancy, so now the PCB should fit in, but we want to make sure it doesn't move around too much, so we can use this hole here, uh, draw a circle, make a pad, so pop it up, so now we have something to keep the PCB anchored. Uh, but there's one more thing we can do here. We have this nice little oval, so we can create uh, another uh, sketch here, constrain it, pad it. Uh, and then one final thing. Uh, remember we had those uh, the slides on the side of, of the USB connector. Uh, we can kind of approximate those in plastic as well. Uh, draw some lines on the top and the bottom. Uh, make sure they're fully constrained. Uh, pad those out and you have this. And so if we put the PCB in place, you can see it seems to fit very nicely. Um, one last step. Remember I said that uh, step is kind of the PNG or the JPEG of the hardware world. Well, it turns out a lot, if you go to DigiKey, for example, a lot of components, the manufacturers actually create step files for them. And so you can pull those into your design and use them in FreeCAD. Uh, I went to DigiKey and I found just a random USB port and I pulled that into FreeCAD and I used that to make sure that my design would fit. And uh, I mean, this is, you know, 3D printing is one thing, but just being able to move it around is instant and make sure that it can fit. And so by pulling in these step files from various manufacturers, you can get very instant feedback as to whether or not your, your part is going to fit. Um, so again, here is what we submitted. This is the step file that we submitted to the factory. And then here is what they sent back. So they changed it a little bit, you can tell. Um, this is after we sent them a sample PCB. So you can see there's some uh, uh, support structures on the side to help the PCB fit in because they realized that the mouse bytes on the side uh, were gonna prevent the PCB from uh, setting in there nicely. Uh, you could see they added some finger holds on the side to help people uh, be able to pull it out. And that was something where they asked, is it okay if we add this? And uh, no cost. I said, sure, why not? Um, you could also see these holes in the bottom. And these are what the lifters go into to make that nice snapping uh, sensation. So because these holes are there, there really isn't any piece of plastic that is over any other piece of plastic. They've made holes that will allow for this overhang to happen. Uh, and of course, they added some rounding just to, to kind of make sure that it fits better in uh, the injection molder machine. And you can, as, as it sweeps around, uh, the really nice plastic hooks there that move out of the way when you force a PCB in there. Uh, so I sent them, so they sent me to this, they sent this file to me. And in fact, I have this in the Tomu hardware repository. Fun fact about those, those holes, they make the PCB plastic case so much nicer, but they also make it un-3D printable. Um, <laughs> like it's one of those cases where for some reason, because uh, it's this very close, in, enclosed space, uh, every time I try to print it on the Form Labs Form 2 printer we have, it just freaks out. Uh, I tried once and it failed. Um, so it's, it's kind of interesting to see that there are things you could do in plastic that you can't do uh, in, commer in, in home 3D printers. Um, the next thing they wanted to do is make a 3D printed prototype. And I don't have a picture of this because I never saw it. Uh, they basically said, can we do a 3D print to make sure it works? And I said, sure. And then you know, a week later they come back and they said, it's good. I think, okay. <laughs> let's, let's, let's actually make the case. Uh, and so once that's approved, once they've come up with a design that you're okay with, they have to cut steel. And that is usually done with a process called EDM, electro discharge machining. Uh, and this just looks cool. Like it's just very photogenic. I love EDM. They've got this lovely blue plastic uh, tube that dispenses uh, a dielectric fluid. Uh, what they do is they use a CNC machine to carve a block of copper. 
and then they bring that copper into contact with steel, and they pass a very high current through it, and the steel is actually ablated by the copper electrons. Uh, and so it's because copper is much easier to machine than steel. You really can't machine steel uh, so easily and get the tight tolerances, but the copper is very easy to do. And copper will also take a high current uh, very happily. So they use electrons to knock off uh, the pattern from the steel. And once that's done, this takes a couple of weeks, uh, you get what's called a T0 shot. That's test shot number zero. Uh, this is an example of the Novena case. Uh, and you can see this has some problems. And, you know, when does your first compile ever work, right? The first one always has problems, and they know it, and that's why they call it a T0 shot. Uh, there are a couple of things to note here. The plastic on this particular piece came in through those four circles on the side. This is where the feet go. We put it underneath the feet because it hides it. Um, here's an annotated version. You can see there are these gray lines, and that's where the cool plastic flowed. Uh, there's also a knit line there in the middle, and that's where the two um, bits of plastic met, the two flows met. And there's some, also some sink marks, and that's where there were uh, features on the other side, underside, that caused these dips to happen. And you see this, this all the time uh, in, in the first uh, release of a thing. And they will tune it and change the flow to make it work better. Once you have that, they do what's called finishing. Uh, and finishing is where they bake the tool and they add a texture. And if you do a texture like mirror finish, uh, that can, uh, that they have to polish it and that takes a lot of time and a lot of effort and they have to repolish it after every few hundred shots. Um, you can do what's called uh, texturing uh, and there are books. This is one by a company called Mold Tech. Uh, they're books that just have textures in there. And with this, it's basically a thing they load into the CNC machine when they make that copper plate. Uh, and it, um, it, it gives your, your product, you can choose which texture. They have everything from sandblasted to leather to a whole bunch of other textures. Uh, you pick the texture you want and it gets put in there. And if it's a very complicated texture, it can hide a lot of defects from things like those flow lines, from the sink marks, uh, from other uh, defects that you may get. Uh, so finishing is a great way to um, uh, work around some of the problems you will have. And once it's finished, your tool is good for usually 100,000 shots. Uh, so once it's finished, you're good to go for the next 100,000 shots before they need to uh, redo the tool, uh, kind of sharpen it up, uh, because over time the tool wears down. And once you're done with that, you're ready to go to manufacture, uh, and you're ready to shoot some plastic. Uh, and so with that, I'd like to just go over some real world problems or, that you, you'll see. Uh, these are things that I just had. I don't know how much time we have. Uh, two or three minutes, two minutes to go, okay. Um, I'll, I'll just do one then. Uh, this is a clothes peg that I have uh, in my house. Um, some interesting things to note here. Uh, there's some uh, 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 parting lines, and this is where when the machine came together, they injected it with plastic and it pulled apart. Uh, you can see some seams here uh, for when it pulled apart. Um, uh, this is the thing that is, is difficult to hide sometimes. A lot of times with cases, they'll put it on one of the edges. Um, that's one way to hide it. Uh, this is a cheap clothes peg and they didn't really care to hide it at all. Um, if you open it up, there's some things to see here. Uh, up here on top, this is where the, the gate was. There's a little bit of flashing left over here. This is where the plastic entered, uh, this particular piece. Uh, these things you're gonna see everywhere now. These are where the ejector pins uh, made contact with this piece. This is where those pins pushed this out of the case. Um, down here, I don't really know what was going on here. This is a really messy uh, tool. This must have been like a journeyman who was doing this. Uh, this looks like it was edited after the fact um, uh, because it's a complete mess. And in fact, these two are not the same at all. So probably this tool has been used for a very long time. And because it's a clothes peg, nobody bothered to clean it up after 100,000 shots. Uh, so it's interesting to see things like this. And again, you're gonna see these ejector pin marks everywhere now. Yeah, different pieces of the family. So they, they didn't, um, uh, they were inconsistent. So this is a definitely a low quality piece. Um, so just to kind of summarize everything, uh, it's important to understand the production process. Uh, it's entirely possible to design with open source tools. Um, like was mentioned in the keynote this morning, 
uh, just take baby steps. You know, do a case first before you decide to do a fully articulated something else. Uh, just do a case first. Uh, and finally, now that you know what to look for, uh, you can see design artifacts from the production process of injection molded plastic everywhere. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for coming. The question was, he understands Tovo because we talked about it. What is FOMU? FOMU uh, is the uh, FPGA version of Tomo that we're working on right now, where it's actually crowdfunding right now. It's a, a link there to our crowdfunding page. It's an ICE 40 version of Tomo. We do the USB in FPGA gateway. Uh, and so it's an FPGA in your USB port. Any advice on finding a factory in China to do the manufacturing? Uh, we have a contract manufacturer. It's called AQS. Um, if you do a crowdfunding campaign, uh, we go through a company called Crowd Supply. They generally have a list of contract manufacturers who they recommend, or at least know of. Um, the contract manufacturer should have contacts with a plastic house uh, that uh, can help you out. Uh, and I'd much rather go through word of mouth rather than uh, I did another project where I was just looking on uh, AliExpress. Uh, that was okay. I mean, they were kind of surprised when I showed up in the door and did a factory tour of them. Um, but uh, I think going through your contract manufacturer as recommended by somebody you know uh, is, is the best way to go. So, question? Yeah, so the question was, uh, what stops the plastic from falling down where the ejector pins are? Um, yes, yeah, so if you look at the uh, picture of the ejector pins, um, which I don't have right now, uh, there was that one picture of the ejector pins. They are actually physically there. Um, so the ejector pins move with the whole system, and they only move about a very small amount. Uh, so that would be this one. Um, so these ejector pins are actually inside the, the mold themselves. Uh, and there is no cavity there. Yeah, so this is, this is an example uh, that I didn't get a chance to show. This is an Aircon remote control. And you can see there are three spots here where there's a little bit of a, a vertical difference between where the ejector pins are uh, and where uh, the rest of the case was. So ejector pins almost always cause an artifact. And if it's not in a place that you care about, you just leave them there. Yes? Okay, so the first question was about FreeCAD and whether it can do uh, some of the really cool artsy things that um, people want to do now. Um, I believe it can. I believe there are ways to do padding and then you can also fillet it. Uh, so you probably do a graded fillet. Um, that is probably possible. <laughs> it's not a thing that we ended up doing with Tomu, so I am not entirely familiar with it. But I do know that you can fillet it. Uh, and I have done some sweeping shapes like that. It does not, as far as I know, have support for things like NURBS. Um, so you can't get some of the really cool artistic things that also usually happen to be unmanufacturable. <laughs> so because if you limit yourself to a very simple palette, then you're more, more likely to make something that can actually be built. Uh, and as for the other question, that was about uh, T0. T -zero. Uh, what things can you do to a T0 shot uh, to fix it? Uh, they can do various things like adjusting the temperature of the plastic. They can adjust the rate of flow. Um, so the problem with the flow lines is that it cools too quickly. And so by uh, either increasing the flow rate or increasing the temperature, they can prevent that from happening, make sure it's no longer flowing when it uh, starts to solidify. One more question? Uh, 
this, what are the sizes of the non-recoverable engineering costs, NRE costs? Uh, if you are going to some large manufacturer like Foxconn, they will say $45,000. Uh, that is not what we paid at all for this. It's about an order of magnitude too much. So well under 5,000 US dollars in terms of NRE for something like this, for a relatively small tool, for a relatively small case. Uh, now, one thing I didn't mention is that uh, the family mold is, uh, for this one, was four pieces. Uh, for the, the more, because it takes 30 seconds, it's in terms of, of time for how much one particular piece costs. Um, you can, you don't even have to replace the core. You can actually edit the core and add like a little tiny area. So if I wanted to do a plastic toothpick, for example, uh, we wouldn't even have to buy a new core. We would just have them add that on to that piece. So once you've paid the NRE, it becomes a lot cheaper. So under $5,000 uh, would be my you know, up, upper end of the, the scale, um, the most you should expect to pay for something of this size. Yeah, so, so it's, it's possible to get, get local, locally made, locally sourced, fair trade uh, injection molding tools. Um, uh, but of course, it does drive up the cost. Uh, yeah. Right. So for something small like a Tomu case, uh, we, we, we were able to do it very economically. Uh, but for something that's larger, you saw some of the, the, the blocks there are very large. Uh, it does drive up the cost. And that's just, again, 30% of that is just raw steel. So thank you all for coming. Oh, thank you.